start it today. So our kind of sequence of things to do is I am going to go over the kind of general, I'm not going to go over all the code for Moon Globe, I'm going to go over the kind of basic outline of how you should have solved. I know Ben also went over it yesterday in lab, but I'm going to also go over it sometimes two different perspectives help. Then we're going to talk about uh, vector of vectors, and that will probably be it today. I think that we'll get to procedures on Tuesday. We're also going to be talking about type defs, something that I doubt most of you have seen at this point. Um, one, just a quick announcement that I am flipping all the due dates now for the labs to Thursday morning, and that way in lab you can work on the previous week's assignment, and Ben can help you with that. I suspect that that may give you an extra opportunity to get some assistance if you can't get to TA office hours on Monday and Tuesday. Also, um, just a reminder that on Mondays and Fridays, office hours are in Mingal 235, not in 416. So on Tuesday and Thursday, the office hours are in Mingal 416, but on Monday and Friday, they are in Mingal 235. And the reason for that is the CS102 instructors asked us on Monday and Friday to move to a different room because that's when their labs are due on Monday evening. And so their crush is on uh, Friday and Monday. So they wanted to separate it. So we did that for them. So just remember that. Uh, also, I did see on Piazza's, um, and Ben had said that uh, some of you seem not to know how to get started with Moonglow and felt that it was not really connected with what we did in lecture. But we went over, if you may remember, we went over with CN how to jam and un or how to unjam things. And we went through this program, which was we first went through a program where we summed up input. So we took input and summed it up. And then we cleared. So if it was bad input, we cleared the input and we consumed it. So we actually did go through exactly the structure that you should have been using for the moon glow problem. Okay, now you may not have copied the code down and that's a mistake. Okay, because if I go over code, you really either need to copy it down or if you didn't get it, you should ask me. I'll always be happy to send you a copy of it. But this was exactly the code. All moon glow was doing was building on this summing of input, right? Because Moonglow was giving you either integers to sum or it was giving you some string input that you had to do something with. So all we were doing was taking what I had presented in class and asking you to expand on it a little bit. I mean, we didn't want you doing exactly in lab what we did in class because that would be regurgitation. We wanted you to take something that had been presented in class and try to put a little more meat on the bone, so to speak. Okay? So if I present code in class and it's not in the notes, try to make sure you get it into your notes. And if you don't have time to get it into your notes, send me some email. I'll be happy to send the code to you. Okay? But it was very definitely presented more than a week ago in class basically the guts of how to do moon glow. Okay, so I'm going to go over it again, which is that essentially you had, well, in this case, this was the first version. Then we did the second version. So the second version 
we assumed, actually the first version was fine, we'll do the first version. So we said that you basically had to write a loop that simply kept going while there was more input. And the first thing you did was assume that you're getting a number. Okay, and if you get a number, you do something. Otherwise, the next thing you do is if it fails, you first check to see if you have end of file, because if it's not a number, it could be because you reached end of file, in which case you set more input to false because there's no more input. Otherwise, you have a string, and you need to do something with the string. So this was exactly the moon glow thing, which is your input was either a score, it was a string, or you reached end of file. Okay, so this was exactly the moon glow thing. And if it was a string, you first had to call cn.clear to unjam cn, and then you needed to read the input into the string variable. Now, Moonglow made you expand this in a number of ways. Okay? So, if the score, if the input was a um, score, you simply added it to your running total, much as we did in some inputs. So, that in fact was a lot like what we had. And also, if you reached into file, it was the same thing. You simply set more input to false and got out of there. The big change in Moonglow was in this part, which is where it was a string. In Moonglow, that was no longer an error that you simply discarded. You had to do something with that string. Okay? So the interesting part in Moonglow was this last part where it was a string. So it was basically while there was more input, okay, and you could, using pseudocode, if, um, score, if input is a score, then you add it, add score to running total, or just to total, total score, else if EOF, we set more input to false, else it's a string, input is a string, so we had to call cn.clear to unjam cn, and then cn into, um, I'll call it label, so clear input from cn. And now what were the two possible values of the label? Name is one of them, so the first thing you could do is check to see if label equals equals name. I forget, I think it was capitalized, but if it was name, then it guaranteed that the next item was the student's name. So you needed to read student's name. And what was the other possibility? It could be average. <clears throat> okay, and what did you do if it was average? What, what followed average? Pardon? Right, so you needed to average all the scores that follow. So basically, you now need to enter a while loop while, so while there is another score, 
So while more scores, okay, you um, are going to add a score to average, and you need to increment your count variable. And then once you get out, you can add to total score your average divided by count because that gives you, so you're just adding the average score into total score. Okay, so then you're still not done because this part still has to be fleshed out. So what I'm doing is a good way to attack a program, which is instead of trying to start writing code immediately, try to figure out what you need to do with each of the cases and kind of write it out using what we call pseudocode, English sentences, and then slowly develop that into actual C++ code. So this still isn't down to the level of C++ code. I still need to refine that, okay? So one thing is I need to always remember to initialize variables to zero because if I fail to do that, my count and average are going to pick up from their previous values. So one thing I need to remember to do here is to insert before the while loop some code to set count to zero and average to zero. Otherwise, it's just going to pick up from the previous values of average and count. <coughs> okay, now while more scores. Okay, you can think about how you might determine if there's more scores. Okay, well, one way is to simply read the score Okay, that's, that works perfectly. As long as the next input value is a integer, it will succeed. So that is as good as saying while more scores. Okay. Now, once you're done, once this loop, this while loop exits, not only do you add the average to total score, but what condition do you need to check before you actually add it to total score? That the count wasn't zero. Dr. Planck's write-up said that Moonglow's a little scatterbrained, and sometimes after average, there's no score. So you actually need to add an if statement right here, which I won't do, but add an if statement. to ensure count is greater than zero before you actually add it. Otherwise, you'll get something called NAN, which stands for not a number. Okay, and your program might actually terminate at that point because division by zero is something that causes programs to terminate. And you'll see NAN for not a number. Okay, there's also, so even after you've done that, you're down here after this while loop. Okay, what has happened to CN as a result of it exiting the while loop? Is CN in a good state right now? No, it's in a bad state. The only reason that it exited it was because it didn't read a number. Correct? So before we continue, after we've computed an average, we need to unjam CN. Now, why could CN at this point have exited that loop? There's two reasons. 
Yes. There's different ways to do it. This is, I'm just saying, this is one way to do it, okay? I actually originally did the way you suggested, and I thought it was too complicated. So I didn't think the logic was as straightforward. So th if you did it that way, fine. But this is the way I'm doing it now. So, And you're right, there's going to be some repetition here. But I will come back to what are the two reasons that CN may be in a bad state here? Failed because it's in the file. So one thing you should do at this point is check to see if CN has reached in the file. And if it has, you set more input equal to false. Okay, else, what's the other reason it failed? Exactly. It read a non-integer, in which case it's okay to just say cn.clear. You don't need to consume it at this point because you'll simply now go back to the top of the loop. It will fail because it's not an int, and it will now come down here. It will clear it again, and you will, again, process whatever thing it is. And this is what you're saying. I understand that you're repeating some logic. And actually, it's very interesting. Now, okay, so this is roughly the logic for Moonglow. Now, I don't expect you to take this analysis any further than this, but I am. You could reasonably ask yourself, is this logic really necessary right here? Because it's duplicating this logic right here. So you could reasonably ask yourself, what if I don't really, if I don't include this logic, what will happen? Okay, what will happen is we will, let's say it failed because of an EOF condition. It will come up to here. It will try to read a score and it will fail because we've reached end of file. We'll come down here. We'll ask if it's end of file. It is, so we'll set more input equal false and the right thing will happen. Okay, so it turns out we actually don't need this. Okay, so we could say, do we need this to clear it if there's more input? Well, it will come here. It will see that it will attempt the CN, but since CN is jammed, it won't work. It will ask if it's EOF. It's not, so it'll get down here and it will clear it. So it turns out that this logic isn't even necessary but I don't expect you to take it that far. However, if you did, you would find out that it's not even necessary, that the, lo that the loop works without it. So in fact, it turns out that this is the basic backbone of Moonglow. Now, a couple times I saw that Students were saying we got a few round off errors. I was getting like 95 out of 100 correct. And at least in one of those cases, it was because instead of always adding your totals to total score, what was happening was the student was maintaining two different variables, one that was keeping track of all of the averages and one that was keeping track of all of the individual scores and then at the end added the two together and it was causing just very tiny rounding errors. Okay, um, Probably would have been, I can't easily modify Dr. Plank's scripts. If I did, I'd probably have made it accurate to like maybe three digits rather than four. Someone asked, why can't we just make it accurate to two digits? There was a reason for that, which is he wanted you to use doubles rather than floats. And if you could have it accurate to only two digits, it was possible 
the cases would, would succeed if you use floats rather than doubles. That's why he did have it out to like four decimal points because of the doubles. Okay, the other thing, it is so tempting right here for you all when it says to while more input to think, oh, I am going to put in here while not cn.eof. And why did I tell you? I told you last week that this would fail and that it would lead to grief. Why? Yes. Yes, because CN is reactive and we have to actually perform a read before we know that we've reached end of file. So when we reach this spot, even if we've reached EOF end of file, this will return false one more time and we'll enter the loop one too many times. So do not put that there or just lead to grief. I don't care if you put here while true and down here you put under C and over here you put break. I do know that Dr. Plank will rant about how much he hates it in 302 if you do it that way. So it's a matter of style. I like break statements. I think that they're straightforward and understandable. Dr. Plank thinks they're an um, abomination. Okay, so it's just a difference in style. So I'm fine with you doing it either way in this class with the understanding that you reach when you reach 302, Dr. Plank dislikes the use of break statements. Okay, and he said it was because when he did some industry work and saw some code that break statements led to some problems. Or at least he felt they led to problems with readability. But at any rate, questions about this? Yes? So I read that's okay. Uh, so that's okay, except there's one danger to that. Okay. okay. So the question was that he he discovered the A to F and A to I functions, which stand for ASCII to float and ASCII to integer. Okay, there's one problem with these commands, which is they return zero if um, the string cannot be converted to a number. Okay, that's not a problem in this particular lab. But let's say that I was making you compute averages, okay, and the numbers came in as 10, 0, 15, and 20, and you were throwing out anything that wasn't a number you would end up saying, you would end up throwing this one out because it would return zero and you would think, oh, that's not a number. It failed to convert it to a number. In fact, it succeeded. It converted it to zero. So you would end up giving this student an average of 45 divided by 3, which is 15, when in fact the average was 45 divided by 4, or 11.25. So the danger of A to F is it actually can't tell you whether when it returns zero, you don't know whether the number was really zero or whether it was not a number. Okay, in this case, you could have simply discarded it and because you were just keeping a running total. Well, no, it was a problem because you had to calculate the average. Yeah, so, so that's a problem. It didn't, it didn't okay, okay, but that... We don't, okay, for that reason, 
we'd rather that you use string streams to do your conversion. So rather than using A to F, we prefer that you dump it into an I string stream if you're going to do that. So declare a buffer and then just do buffer dot str whatever your um, value was and then try to read the buffer into a number. Okay, and that way if it succeeds you know it's an integer and if it fails you know it's not. So that's our preferred way of doing it. Okay, so a to F and A to I are considered dangerous just because you can't always, and you, you figured out a way around it, but in C++ this is considered the better way. A to I and A to F were C functions. Okay. Other questions? Was that the same question or did you have a, I saw you had a question back too. Let's see. Did I erase that already? Or just a sec. You're saying here. What I was saying is if you're using A to F and you had this sequence of numbers, 10, 0, 15, and 20, when you tried to convert 0 to a number. The problem is, in Moonglow, you would think that it was not a number because A to F would return zero. And so you would stop doing your average right there. But this gentleman, what's your name? Zach, Zach figured out that you could then do a further test to, to determine whether it really was zero or not. But I'm saying that's a lot of trouble. No, I did the, I did the test initially. Oh, okay. Okay. Looking at the first digit. Did you check to see if the first digit was a dot, a period? That's the prompt because point zero 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 is also a legitimate number. So that's what I mean is now you have to consider all the permutations of what could be a zero. So point zero 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 is also considered zero. So other questions? Okay, so again, if you think sometimes we haven't covered something in class and that the lab's not related to it, go back and look at the class notes and also, like I said, if I do something that's not in the class notes, make sure that you copy it down because there is actually an outstanding chance. I knew that Moonglow was based on something that wasn't in the notes. That's why I went over it in class. Now, I'm not going to sit there in class and tell you write this down as part of the lab, but it is, when I write stuff down, it's, there's a per point to my madness. Okay? Okay. So, moving on. You have not yet seen type defs, and Dr. Plank is a big lover of type defs. I think Dr. Greger not so much. If you end up taking 302 from him rather than Dr. Plank, this won't be as big of a deal. But Dr. Plank likes type defs. So you're going to see a lot of code from Dr. Plank that looks like this. Type def something and a name. So type def stands for type definition. And it's creating a shorthand for a type. So the next thing that comes after type def is some type, and then finally a type, what's called a type name. So what it's doing is saying that type name is equal to this type. So it's saying that type name is the same as type. And that wherever I use type name,
it is the same as type. So here, after doing the type def of int to be Fred, so saying Fred is an int, he now declares i to be Fred, which means that i is really an int because what the C++ compiler does is it runs what's called a preprocessor, and it replaces all instances of Fred with int. Now, of course, you should never be so um, cavalier in your programming as to do something this. If you wanted to make your code as confusing and as unreadable as possible, then by all means, go ahead and redefine your <coughs> ints as frets. But that wasn't his point here. His point was just to introduce type defs. Okay. So he comes up with a more useful form of type defs when he gets to his vector of vectors. So here he is declaring a IVEC, which stands for, what do you think IVEC stands for? Because Dr. Plank loves abbreviations just like C does. Integer vector. So here it is clearly a space savings if he can say IVEC rather than vector of int. Sure it is, Zach. It's a space savings of like over 50%. You may not like the name, but it is a space savings. Hence why a lot of people like me and Dr. Greger aren't big fan of type defs. <laughs> I'm, 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 I buy your argument 100%. But there's another camp which you should know about, and Dr. Plank is in it, that believes type defs are very valuable, especially if you use meaningful names. And so they use them liberally in their code. So I'm not going to impose my beliefs on you. I'm agnostic. If you hate them, you hate them. If you love them, you love them. But you need to know about them. Love them or hate them in your career, you will frequently um, be exposed to type defs, and you need to know about them. So I am telling you what the advantages are, OK? Space savings. If you choose a good name for them that is self-explanatory, then there's a chance it makes your code more understandable. If, as you say, you're maintaining it and you don't, you see IVEC and you have no idea what it is, you may want to strangle someone. Okay? Maybe you're not violent, but you, uh, okay. you, may, not, you may not appreciate it. So, at any rate, you're going to have to get used to type defs in this course because Dr. Plank does like his type defs. So, here, it's a vector of IVEX. So what's really happening is the C++ compiler is going to replace IVEX with vector int. And you end up with actually a vector of vectors. OK. So that brings us to the kind of main topic of the day, which is vector of vectors. So in CS102, you learned that a vector is, how is a vector different from an array? It's dynamic. You can dynamically resize it. That's its big advantage. So you can use pushback, if you remember, you can use the pushback command to dynamically add new elements to a vector and grow its size by one. Adds it to the start of the loop? Start of the loop. End of the vector. Pushback adds to the end of the vector. So if it's currently five characters long and I say this is named v and I say v dot pushback six, uh, ten, it will add a new element five at the end of the vector and assign 10 to it. 
I can also treat existing elements using array notation. So if I say v of 3 equals 15, it will assign 15 to 3. If I try to say v of 7 is equal to 20, it will give me an error message at runtime saying that 7 does not yet exist. Okay, similarly, you cannot say v of 6 equals 20 in order to add a new element. You have to use pushback to add a new element. So this will also get you an error message. Yes? If you wanted to add like, multiple new ones, is there like, would you just have to do pushback multiple times? You have to do pushback multiple times. Yeah, um, there probably, if I went and looked at the API, it might be that you can... Um, concatenate two vectors. I bet there's a way to concatenate two vectors, but there's not, you can't say v dot pushback 6, 8, 15 and have it add those three. That won't work. So you have to do it one at a time, which usually is what you want to do anyhow. You're reading one token at a time and it's usually not a problem. Okay, so any questions about that? Quick review of vectors. Okay, and you can also resize a vector. So another way to add elements, let's say that it was currently four elements, you could say v dot resize, say eight, and now it would extend it so that it had entries for four, five, six, and seven. And it would fill it with the default value. Typically it's zero for integers. Yes? Should we rely on that just being initialized to zero? I wouldn't. <laughs> I take that with a big grain of salt. I've seen that in a couple of textbooks, and I still don't believe it. I have never gone and looked at the C++ standard, but the C++ standard um, is, um, this says nothing about what arrays should be initialized to, and so I can't believe that the standard says that vectors should be initialized to anything either. So I think it's up to the implementer. So I would not rely on it to be zero. Okay, now there is a exception. If you initially had vector int, you may remember this little thing, v8, zero. That says the initial size is eight and the default value is zero. Now you could be assured that the fill value is zero. Okay, that is a guarantee. But you don't normally declare a vector like that. You normally declare a vector with no arguments because the whole point of having a vector is that it's dynamically resizable. If you know in advance exactly how big your data is, use an array because an array is far more efficient than a vector. Okay, so Dr. Plank uses something from his research called Vandermond matrices to try to motivate his uh, use of vector of vectors. So let me take a step back and just say a lot of data comes in the form of tables rather than in single dimensional Unit. So if you have a spreadsheet, right, a spreadsheet is got rows and columns. If you have a game of tic-tac-toe, rows and columns, photographs, they are represented as tables of rows and columns. Each line of a photograph is actually a set of what we call pixels. Each pixel has what is called an RGB value for red, green, and blue, which is gives it its color. So for example, and most of the times it's a value between 0 and 255. So you might have um, 0 for red, 0 for green, and 255 for blue is going to give you a blue. 
giving 255 for green and 255 for blue and a zero for red is likely to give you what color for those of you who are artists or love colors? Surely we have one artist in here. Yellow. yellow. So that gives you a yellow. So at any rate, every pixel of a photograph is encoded this way. Well, there's different encodings, but this is a common encoding. So your photos are just each of these entries has three integer values, one for red, one for green, one for blue. The pixels are the little dots. If you look at your screen, there's, if, and you eyesight is good enough, there's tiny of little dots. You can actually, if you came up here and looked, you could actually see little squares here. But your eye takes the amalgamation of dots and interprets it as a picture. At any rate, this long-winded discussion is to make it clear that we often need to represent tabular data in our programs. And these things, I like to refer to them as tables, but they're often also referred to as matrices. Okay, how many of you have had linear algebra thus far, matrix algebra? Okay, just a few of you, so not enough to really, but when you get to linear algebra, you'll learn about matrices, and they are two-dimensional tables. So you often have to represent tables and matrices in computers, and a way to do that is with a vector of vectors. So if I want it to represent a vector of, or a table of ints, one way to do it is as a vector of vector of ints. Now, should you write this out like I have just done? There is a nasty little bug, well, feature in older versions of C compilers, C++ compilers, that require that you put a blank space there. Newer versions of the compiler aren't Fooled, but why do you think, what do you think, if I put it like with no space, what does those last two characters look like to the compiler? C an operation. It looks like a read operator. So some compilers get confused and think, oh, that's a read operator, and then they say improperly terminate it type. So if you put a space in there, it guarantees happiness from your compiler. Now you will notice Dr. Plank did not have to do that here. That's another advantage of type defs, is that the compiler understands that IVEC is a type, a vector of integers, and so he was able to put the brackets right up there, even though on translation IVEC goes to a vector of ints. Okay, so what you're really talking about with the vector of ints is a vector, and each individual thing is a vector. Okay, so each of these are really a vector of int. So initially, this vector is actually empty. If you looked at it, it would look like nothing. But eventually, he does a resize on his vector. Okay, so what he's doing is he is computing something that he calls a Vandermond matrix. So let's just quickly. We're not going to worry too much about the details. I want you to focus more on the vector, but a van der Vaughan matrix is one that has the value i plus 1 to the jth mod. What is the mod operator in C++? Percent sign. Some prime number. So the entry in row i and row j is i plus 1 to the jth power mod p. You might ask yourself, why in the world would you even care why 
my question is, how did someone ever invent this? But a mathematician named Vandermond did, and it turns out to be very useful in error correcting codes. So Dr. Planck's research used to be error correcting codes. So when stuff gets transmitted, for example, over the internet, occasionally a bit flips. So that could be bad, like if you're transferring money from one bank to another and a bit flips kind of high up in the number, that could be a problem, right? Totally changes the amount of the transfer. So a lot of you know, companies have a big interest in making sure that data, when it's transmitted, arrives correctly on the other end. So often data is actually transmitted with additional bits, which are called error correcting bits, that allow you to determine if the data that you've received is corrupted or not. And if it's corrupted, sometimes you can correct it using these error correcting bits. Other times you can only detect that it's corrupted and ask for a resend. But at any rate, this gets into pretty abstract math. Don't worry about understanding what a Vandermont matrix is, other than that the first six letters of it are really cool. Okay? <laughs> so, um, but that's how he's calculating each entry of his matrix is in row i and row j is equal to i plus 1 to the j's power mod p. Okay, and if you print out some of these puppies, here's one where there's three rows, five columns, and the prime number is 7. So you can do the multiplication. We start our columns at, so if we do, for example, this number right here, that is 0. We're doing still numbering from 0, so that's row 2. So i is equal to 2. j is equal to 0, 1, 2. So j is also equal to 2. So we have 2 plus 1 to the jth power mod 7, which equals 3 squared mod 7, equals 9 mod 7, which equals 2. Okay, so there you have it. So what he's doing is he's first doing, he's reading command line arguments. And anyone remember what C air does? Writes to standard air, so writes to an air stream. And normally that's just redirected to the console. So saying the usage is VDM rows columns primes. Then he's using the trick that I told you about. He's defining a string stream. And for each of his three arguments, user supplied arguments, he's reading them into a row column and prime variable. and He's checking to make sure that it actually read as a number, and if it doesn't, he's printing out an error message and exiting. Then he resizes his outer vector, his row vector, so to speak, to be the number of rows. So VDM, let's say that R was 3. That means he now has a outer vector of size 3. That's what the resize if R is 3. Now he's coming through this loop. And for each row, so that's what this is. For each row, he is going to, remember it is I plus 1 to the J mod P. So base, this is base right here. <clears throat> and his initial value is 1 because base to the 0 power is equal to what? When j is 0, what much, what's the first value always? Don't be shy. 1. Base to the 0 power is 1. 
So that's why he initializes his value to 1, because the first entry on each row is 1. So now he starts by saying j equals 0, j less than c, and he does this line right here, push back val. So initially, i is equal to 0. OK, so he is doing VDM 0, which is this entry right here, push back val. So val is equal to 1. So what gets added here is, actually the way I should really show this, really has something that looks like this. Now he's adding an entry to v sub 0, and it's 1. Now he sets val to be val times base. So base was equal to i plus 1. So base is currently 1. So 1 times base mod p, let's say p is 7, is what? What is 1 mod 7? 1. So val remains as 1. We come back to the top of the loop. i gets incremented to be 1. No, we don't. Sorry. Wrong loop. i is still 0. We come back to this loop right here and increment j. j becomes 1. So now we say VDM 0 dot pushback val. So this becomes 1. Another 1 is added. And because base is 1, all of our val is going to remain 1. This is a pretty boring row. So if c is equal to 5, all 1s are going to end up in the first row. In fact, if you look at all of his Vandermond matrices down here, you'll see that every single one of them, the first row is all 1. So that's pretty boring. But it gets more interesting. When i gets incremented to be 2, I'm sorry, i is incremented to be 1, now the base becomes equal to what? 2. So the base is now 2. So it's going to be more interesting. We're still on entry 1, going to push a 1 here. But now, when we calculate val, val times base is 2. So val is going to set, be set to 2. The next time we come through, 2 gets pushed onto here. Then 2 times 2 is 4, so the next time 4 gets pushed on. Okay, then val becomes what? 4 times 2 mod p is what? 1, so val becomes 1, so 1 gets pushed on here. And finally 2. So you can see what's happening is each of the rows is slowly being, having its vector inflate it. It's like we initially each, think of each, initially, think of us as getting like empty balloons. So each of the three rows has an empty balloon. Okay, but then we start inflating it. Okay, so each of them were inflating the empty balloon, so it's slowly getting bigger. Okay, so it's just like inflating a balloon. Initially it's empty, and then the balloon gets bigger as we add thing, air to it. So that's what a vector of vectors is. It's simply a fancy name for a table or a matrix. Okay, but initially it's nothing, and then we inflate. Okay, so the way we inflate the rows is we do a resize operation. So with a vector of vectors, 
Sorry, I've been standing most of the day, so often you're going to see me sit in this class. So with a vector of vectors, the basic principle is not always going to be the case, but one way we handle a vector of vectors is that the first dimension, the rows, we get using a resize. So if this is, um, say, I'll call it picture instead, the first thing we might do is say picture dot resize, and it's going to be equal to the number of rows. So that's how we inflate the rows, and then we inflate the columns by doing pushbacks. So the columns we inflate using pushback. So that's a common idiom. It's not the only one, but it's a common way of doing things. <coughs> so the rows, like say, we could we inflate using a resize. So we might here then say picture say zero dot pushback and that's going to inflate start inflating row zero okay now, having said that, that's one way to do the inflation. Here's a second way. Okay, so this is one way to inflate the, I'll call it table. Here's a second way. is to calculate one row at a time, so basically inflate the column first. So this was kind of, this approach we inflated the row first and then the columns. The second way is to inflate the column first. Okay, using pushback. Okay, then second, inflate the rows by using pushback, or I'm just going to say by adding a row using pushback. Okay, I'll show you this. So let's say you were reading a picture and you didn't know how in advance how many rows the picture had. Could happen. That's uncommon actually. Generally pictures are encoded with the rows and columns, but let's just say the picture is coming in with an unknown number of rows. So in that case, you'd have to use the second way to inflate the table because the first way can't be used because in order to use the first way, what do you need to know? The number of rows. So if I don't give you the number of rows in advance, you have to use the second way. So the second way, what we'd essentially do is I'm going to give you pseudocode. You would um, say something like while... Um, read a line, so while read a line, read a line of pixels, you would have to do something like vector of, say, ints. We'll assume now for the time being that pixels are a single value. You might have something like row, and you're going to now 
for each pixel in line, you're going to do row dot pushback on pixel. And then at the end, let's say that we have a vector a vector of ints that is a picture we would say picture dot pushback row so this is step one this is step two step one inflates the column first using pushback and then two, we inflate the row by using pushback to push that row onto it. Now, question. Does it make a difference if I declare row this vector here or outside of the loop? Why? Not quite rewrite the, okay. So the answer is yes, there's a difference. If you declare row inside the while, then every time through the while loop, row will be um, thrown away and a new one will be created for you. Okay? That's usually not the way we want you to do it. Usually, we want you to declare everything at the top. Okay. If you declare everything at the top of your program, so I'm getting rid of some stuff I did. So if you declare everything at the top of your program, like that, then what you would need to do is clear, you'd have to say row.clear at the beginning, what that would do is clear out the previous row. Otherwise, you would just keep adding to it. And this is not the only way I could have done this. There is some, there is another way, but this is a fine way. Now, how do you think you would do that particular line? Actually, let's start with here. How do you read a line of pixels? Get line. So you would replace this particular thing with get line. If you're reading from CN. Okay, how do you now replace, I'm saying for each pixel in line, that's pseudocode, how am I actually going to extract the pixels from the line? It's a string of integers. Okay, but how do I, I guess the question is how do I loop through a string? Um, so not quite. Pardon? So, okay, but you can't use CN on a string. You can't treat it, so what you have here is 25, 50, 75, 45. You can't treat it as an array because if you say line of zero, you're going to get two. If you say line of 1, you're going to get 5. If you say line of 2, you're going to get a blank space. So you can't treat it like a vector. You can, but it won't give you the right result. 
think back. So, so what did we make you? What have we been making? What have we been banging on you with? What particular way to convert strings to integers? String stream. So what you have to do is shove it into a string stream and then read it out from the string stream. So what you would do is you would declare a string stream up here. Say line reader. And you would actually say line reader. And again, you have to make sure you call clear, clear the previous version. Then I know I'm putting it on one line. You shouldn't do that, but I'm short on space. String line. And then while line reader. into pixel. And that will read a pixel at a time. Okay, so see how I went from pseudocode to actual C code. This is what I do a lot. I find it that's a nice way to slowly increase, to, to slowly go from a high-level idea drilling down to get the actual code. But you don't have to do it my way, but that's my way. I find it helpful. Different professors will show you different ways of coding. This is my way of coding. So questions about this? Okay. Oh, you might notice that on lab two and three, <laughs> we're doing PGM files. So there might be useful. Okay, so our last thing today is that not all of our vector of vectors need to be rectangular. Sometimes we like to be able to represent non-rectangular stuff. So here's Pascal's triangle. How many of you have seen Pascal's triangle before? So how many haven't? It's okay to say you haven't. Few haven't. So this is a, turns out, a convenient way to represent combinations of things. Like let's say I have a blue marble, a red marble, a black marble, and a green marble. Four marbles. And I might ask, how many combinations of two marbles do I have? Okay, there's something called combinations which say four choose two, which if you haven't seen it before, don't worry about it. But this says how many ways can you choose two items? How many ways? It's a mathematical way of saying how many ways can we choose two items or two marbles from four marbles. Well, Pascal's triangle gives us the answer to this question. Okay, so it turns out that if we go down to row four of this Pascal's triangle, it answers the question of the first one answers the question of how many ways we can choose a single marble. That should be pretty clear. There's only four different ways to choose one marble. It turns out that there are three ways to choose two combinations of marbles. Isn't Pascal's triangle starting to work? It may, because I was starting to... Uh, just a second. Four choose three is four times three... Yeah, so just a second. This is zero choose, plus one, two choose, one, two. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it's four factorial over two factorial, two factorial, four times three over two. So it should be this row. Okay, I'm wrong. 
Wrong row. You're right. The indexing starts at zero. So in fact, row four is here. This is zero. This is two, three. So this is four. So there are, if you have, just by definition, if you choose zero items, there's one way to do it. If you choose, there's four different ways to choose a single marble. There are six different ways to choose two marbles. Okay, if you did it, green, I'm not going to try to do all of them, but there's black and blue. There is red and blue. There is red and green, red and black, and black and green are the six different ways you can choose two marbles. So this Pascal's triangle gives you the number of different ways you can choose an item from that particular row. Now a neat thing about Pascal's triangle is that on the fringe, it's always ones. Okay, so the outer fringe is always ones. Then every interior node can be calculated from the, its um, two items above it. So one and one gives two. 2 and 1 gives 3, 2 and 1 gives 3, I'm sorry, 3 and 1 gives 4. So you can always calculate the element in a row from the two elements above it in Pascal's triangle. So not only does Pascal's triangle give you the number of ways you can choose X items from Y, but it's also the case that you can get X by calculating it from the two items above it. Okay, so if I am in row I, or row R, column C, that's equal always to, well, if we look at 6, you can see that it's always equal to row R minus 1, and if you look at the column, that's C minus 1 plus row of R minus 1 C. So all the inner values can be calculated this way. Okay, I'm just going to take a couple more minutes. If you have to leave, I understand. But So what he's done is he is he's writing a program that calculates Pascal's triangle for a certain number of rows. And he can do the first approach, so he inflates the rows first. Then for each row, he's going to calculate all the columns. He knows that at the extremes, it's 1. So this is just checking this outer case, which is that the outer values are always 1. So that's what this piece of code is doing. So in that case, he pushed back 1. Otherwise, he's pushing back what I just did. He's looking at the two entries in the previous row at j minus 1 and j. And when he's done, he has a vector of vectors that looks like this. Row 0 is 0. Row 1 is, I'm sorry, is 1. Row 1 is going to look like this. Row 2 is going to be 1, 2, and 1. Row 3 is going to be 1, 
3, 3, and 1. So each, ent each row has one more entry than the previous one. So that's what the vector of vectors looks like in that case. So it's not rectangular, but for those of you who've taken a linear algebra course, it is lower triangular. Because it's a triangle, right? And it's a lower one. If it were the other way, it would be an upper triangular. So we call that a lower triangular table or a lower triangular matrix. So vec the bottom line is vector vectors don't have to be rectangular. They can be any shape you want them to be. Okay? So we will pick this up on Tuesday with procedures, and we'll also be going over more about strings. So both read about procedures and strings in more detail for Tuesday.